Hello, I'm John Keller, political analyst for WB56 News. Well, during the 14 years since this program began, I've played host to hundreds of different guests, everybody from Bill Clinton to Sister Soldia. But no guest ever delivered more intelligence, candor, and humor than David Brudnoy of WBZ Radio. When David passed away in December of 2004, we lost a part of what makes life here in Boston so special. But nothing brings back warm memories of Brudnoy better than enjoying the man in action. Later on, we'll show you a memorable interview we did with David about his autobiography, and we'll recall the lighter side of Brudnoy, including a memorable turn as fill-in weatherman here on WB56. But first, some highlights from the dozens of appearances he made here over the years as a panelist on our roundtable discussions, starting with Brudnoy reacting to the infamous 1992 Republican convention in Houston that put the party's right wing front and center. The Republicans haven't focused on major things. They went off half-cocked at that terrible convention on the family values thing, mm -hmm. that hate campaign of four days of misery mm -hmm. and disgustingness. And I think Americans said, ooh, I mean, there's a recoiling from it. Even, even your fundamental conservative on social issues doesn't want to be preached at by the likes of, of Marilyn Quayle, Pat Robertson, and Pat Buchanan. Here's Brudnoy in 1995, responding to gay-bashing comments by arch-conservative Senator Jesse Helms of North Carolina. As one of your clients said on John's program last week, Joe Malone, he said, I can't relate to Jesse Helms at all. I think a lot of people feel that way. You know, he served certain ends, but he has been uh, vicious in his campaign when he ran against uh, the Hunt. black former uh, mayor yeah. of uh, one of the big cities in his state. And, and, and yeah. it came out, in other words, it seems to me he has become now more uh, simply a curmudgeon at best, and, and in many ways a jerk, at, at least. And, and you, you ask yourself, what exactly is he trying to say? That if uh, little old tobacco farmers in his state got AIDS in greater numbers, he'd care? Uh, you and I were talking about it, and you said you know, that you're convinced it was not about AIDS, it was about homosexuals. And I think you are probably right that in that sense, he wasn't looking at people as equally in need of compassion and research. Uh, you know, that whole thing, well, it's going to break out into the mainstream population, at which point supposedly all Americans would say, oh my God, real human beings rather than them are getting the disease. The main problem that he doesn't understand, he is medically inept enough not to have asked doctors what happens. It is spreading slowly but surely into all populations, especially teenagers. And so that's the coming, fastest growing. Coming in again and again. It's a minority thing, blacks and Hispanics more than whites, teenagers increasingly getting contaminated with it. And once a woman is contaminated by a man, which is much easier than the other way around in heterosexual sex, uh, we now have potential mothers, many of whom will not get tested. And their babies have a much greater chance of surviving without being infected with the HIV virus if they will take they AZT during really, pregnancy. Yeah. So we've got a million problems going on that Jesse Helms simply has reduced to their revolting, disgusting, despicable well, ways of doing it. Brudnoy had little use for the Republican right, and even less for liberal Democrats, including Bill Clinton and Al Gore. First, he takes on Clinton's appeal for more civility in public life. Then, it's Gore's weepy 1996 convention speech. Well, I think he's trying to warm and fuzzify himself, and it says you know, he's now in favor of prayer. He's he's trying to go to the right of Bob Dole in terms of values and so on. And it, I, it doesn't it doesn't compute basically. I think people are wondering where is the real Bill Clinton? Uh, cartoon after cartoon have depicted him as a person who has no center, something a lot of people felt earlier on. And I don't know where it's going to come down. Some people say, gee, I like him now because he's saying what I want to hear about prayer, family values, and so on. Others will say, well, if he felt that all this time, why didn't he say it earlier? Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Isn't he simply showing what we pundits are always clamoring for, the capacity to listen to the electorate and to respond? And to and grow, change and, grow? And, to grow, and to feel this pain? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but no. I mean, in other words, we, we, people... Now you sound just like him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, it's I'm a, a Yale education. That's what they do to I'm, you in New Haven. I'm a independent too. John, I, it seems to me that it may convince some, but as Harry Truman used to say, if you have a choice between a real Democrat and a phony Democrat, always vote for the real Democrat. What is the real Bill Clinton? Why, while he tries to play a little bit of the conservative Republican game, is anybody going to believe it? And I think that's what's happening. The Democrats feeling? have a better I'm a victim and miserable me than the Republicans because uh, when we heard Al Gore, who four years ago told us how 
I plant, the sun was in the I plant, I harvest, I bail, I sell, I smoke, I love tobacco. <laughs> that was I four years. No, no, I did not. There. Actually, I, I forgot a couple. <laughs> that was four years after his sister died of tobacco, uh, we presume, in, uh, induced lung cancer. This year, she died, and I sat with her to the last That was gas. tasteless. And I'm thinking, this is the great lover of tobacco four years ago. Now he hates tobacco. But nonetheless, people were weeping. And we showed Al Gore Sr. And the missus weeping, and Hillary weeps. She's like her husband, the Blitzer. Right. Yeah, yeah, the right. whole thing they was were revolting. Sure. It really was. But, but the yeah, Democrats were more, Reagan wasn't were more vulgar. No, I no. agree. That's what I right. said. But the yeah, Democrats right. were, were a little worse, I think. More often than not, as in this 1997 program, Rudnoy raised serious doubts about both major parties. <laughs> it's the nanny presidency. We won't let you wear T-shirts with nasty words. We don't want you to smoke. We don't want you to gamble. We don't try to do this. We don't. You know, it's it's a it's it's a government by nye nye nye. And the Republicans, on their part, being the stupid party, basically cannot capitalize on any issue that matters, like immigration, as an example, which should be a a no-brainer for them. They just sit there going, duh, because evidently Speaker Gingrich, having been wounded by the charges against him, for which he has to pay a $300,000 fine, while the Macarena King just says, I didn't do it, and if I did, it was all right. Anyhow, and then the, the Democrats are vile, and the Republicans are stupid, and what's left? The American yeah, people are watching amazing. Beavis and Butthead. And his core libertarianism came through in these comments from that same show about the casino gambling debate. I mean, it's always moral rot. I mean, my God, we libertarians, if you want to gamble, gamble. I just don't think the Indians should have an advantage. Let anybody set up a casino if he wants. Let the market determine who gambles. And I think the governor, if he, if he had any energy, pushed anything he really stands for death penalty, privatization, downsizing of government, casino gambling. If you pushed it, he could say simply, we live in a free society, you want to get casino, have it. I don't think it's a public issue that need be discussed by anybody except the c consumers who will go and buy lottery tickets uh, or uh, lottery slots or whatever, and the vendors who will create casinos. But that isn't the way it works in this you state. But the notion that because poor people, less educated people, spend money unwisely from the perspective of those of us who know so much better than they, therefore we should regulate their activities. They spend more money on booze, perhaps. Than in the this wealthy. case, you're they advocating a lifting of regulation Absolutely. on casinos. Precisely. But I'm saying they? that nobody should be obliged by your or my or Glenn's or Marjorie's views not to spend his money as he wishes. And I think when we protect the poor, it is condescension of the sort that has created the public school or rasp by saying they must be in neighborhoods where there's diversity. We'll move them around. We destroyed education because of big government. We've destroyed but welfare because of big government. Let us not destroy the few pleasures left to the poor. David Brudnoy was a serious analyst of serious issues, but it tells you something about the man that he rarely passed up a chance to have a good laugh. Here are some classic examples. First, from an impromptu appearance on our old morning show. Then, from our charity roast a few years back for then House Speaker Tom Finneran. We gotta get David Brudnoy out here, whose, of course, dream has always been. David, get out here. You, here's, here's the weather map here. I'm trying to figure out, I see, okay. There's a keen, New Hampshire, right? Very good, very good. There's na 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 <laughs> Nashua. All right, I see how you do it. I see you've got a, you look at a picture, and you might, there's Lawrence. Now, don't give a, away all of our secrets. No, you here, know, this okay? is more fun than being a radio talk host. You just get to have, and you poke them things. Do they pay you for this, Darren? Really? Believe I mean, it or not. Do you make up the weather, or do you actually have machines? No, I, Do you go out there and look, or what? what I, do you do? It's all accurate, because it, see the stuff I mean, we're we here in a cave, we, in the Taliban we, cave, we, and we're doing television <laughs> this morning, right? And, and you make up this stuff, right? We, it's a little bit more scientific than just making up. See how these clouds, can you see these clouds on the yeah, wall yeah, here? I see, yeah. see these, these are the clouds yeah, that are going to be streaming yeah. in here I tomorrow. Have, I have a bridge I'd like to say to. If you can see a cloud on that one, I can sell you a bridge. How would that do? Right? He's ruining all the secrets here, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Tem astounding, right. Temperatures are, are warmer. It's or, getting warmer. Right? Yeah, it is warmer. Yeah. See the warmer yeah, yeah, air? No, I, I see right, right down there is the, the flow of the white stuff coming up on the green <laughs> yeah, stuff and yeah. coming over to the weather yeah, guy. Yeah, no, right? I'm, I'm getting a little nervous the, here. <laughs> the weird weather guy, right? Temperatures. Do you want to be a talk host or radio? We can shift jobs. You come do my program tomorrow night, and I'll and I'll do this. Okay, we'll see okay. what we can arrange there. Yeah, I you know. It would be kind of fun, you know? I mean, gee willikers, I've always wondered how this is done. I love this notion of point of the cloudy. It's going to be breakfast, it will be cloudy. So Lunch will be mostly cloudy. And dinner, cloudy again. And how hard is it to say cloudy, cloudy, cloudy? I know. Right? All you have to do is read off the screen. I mean, so you don't really do any work, okay. do you? I'm not accustomed to speaking in public. and um, <laughs> The mayor has been... How are you doing tonight, mayor, by the way? 
When the mayor is my guest, he takes over the program. He does this. He'll say, Caller, that's enough. Thank you. We move on. He goes on. When Tom takes the program, I said to him something like, Tell us about the economic situation. He starts in, I go out, I write another book, I come back, he's done. <laughs> I was coming over tonight. It's a tragic thing because I don't know the area much. I don't get out of Boston much and get into, into Methuen here. But I, I, I came here. I'm, I'm walking along the street and I see this poor guy standing there. And he's sort of peddling pencils. And he's, he's got erasers and he's got a, a, a stapler and he's got a bunch of books. And I say, what's the problem? He said, I have no place to go. And so I give him a dollar and I say, What's your name? He said, Byron Rushing. And, and I said, I feel so bad for him. You know, it's, it's been a time of growth. We, we've had nothing but Republican. How are you doing, by the way, Governor? How are the wives? Oh, God. I, um, oh, God. You know, um, God help us. I, I've been doing a little genealogy ever since John Kerry realized that he was Jewish. Um, it's going to be a very interesting race. Think about this. He's on a platform with Joe Lieberman, and Joe says, my Talmud is bigger than your Talmud. And Joe says, mine is bigger than yours. So they go on back and forth with who's got the bigger Talmud. It's going to be a lot of fun. But I learned something here. A cousin of my mother, an old lady, she's 89, she's writing a book about our family. And we did a little, a little genealogy here. And it turned out that my great-great-grandfather, Rabbi Solomon Finderstein, came from Germany in 1840. One of his sons, Shmuley, went to Minneapolis in 1884. His daughter was Doris Finderstein, who's my mother, and I was born in, uh, later on. One of Solomon's sons, Isaac Finderstein, came to Mattapan. His son, Tomas Finderstein, born in 1920, gave birth and changed his name. He's a Jew, too. Cousin! 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 I love you! I love you! I love you, my cousin! <laughs> Mazel Tov! But, uh, it's, it's David the, it, Plotnoy, a mensch. In 1997, David published a memoir of his life and struggle with AIDS, Life is Not a Rehearsal. And in this interview, recorded early that year, we focused on the extraordinary outpouring of support he received from Bostonians in his darkest hour. My coming forward now is because the alternative was a little bit of the gossip, gossip columns. It would have turned the thing into um, apprehension. And I figure, th I, this is a, a cliche of mine, but I live by it. There's only one alternative, do it right or do it poorly. I, I assumed I was, I was negative because uh, my lifestyle is so, it, it's not blame, blameless of, of activity, but it is one of those things where you say, so infrequent as to how does he remember to do it. Um, so yet, there you get the diagnosis. I was dumbstruck by this. I didn't weep over it. I think at one point, as I saw friends getting ill, that I said that there is the fate of all of us at some point. I was so sick for a while, I assumed no one would think anything except, poor baby's got a heart problem. You know? I mean, it didn't dawn on me for a moment that anybody would connect it with anything else. And later, a friend said, so you've got pneumocystis, pneumonia, et cetera. It's sort of like signs saying, middle-aged man, probably gay, it's just, you know, I mean, what are you going to do? At which point, it was apparent, it was just a, a matter of time. I went to, I would call them extraordinary methods, yeah, expensive methods to keep it private, but I believe that privacy is the right of one. I'm ashamed of nothing, it's just that I'm sorry, I'm, I've got AIDS. That video was shot uh, a little more than two years ago in a patient's lounge at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Now, more than two years later, Doubleday Books has published the autobiography of a much more robust-looking David Brudnoy, entitled, <laughs> entitled Life is Not a Rehearsal. And David Brudnoy is here with us to talk about the book. And uh, we were, uh, when we were rolling that tape, you refused to look at it at first. Well, Why? It, well, I, I felt, uh, was it really I? Or as they would say, was it really me? Um, or in the bonics, was that be me? I don't know. I, I, it's hard to remember how ill I was. And remember, that was just two and a half weeks after I had been brought into the hospital nearly dead. 
and uh, to think of how thin I was, and I was amazed in looking at it again that I actually almost made sense on it. Um, you weighed how much? Uh, about 128 pounds. How much do you weigh now? 178. How do you feel now? I feel like a new man, truly. Now, granted, it may not last forever, but you've read, everybody has heard and seen something about the new AIDS combination drug therapy. They call it an AIDS cocktail. Somebody said it's a martini for people up with AIDS. No, it's a series of drugs that you take in combination on a very regular schedule. It seems to have taken thousands of patients and brought them up to a kind of well-being that we never thought was possible and reducing the viral load, the amount of HIV in the blood, in my case, to undetectable levels, by which it means not that it isn't there, only that they can't find it, but the current level of detection. And that is why I suppose I've got the energy to, uh, to subject myself to seeing that thing from 1994 again, John. So in all likelihood, we're going to continue to be able to listen to David Brudnoy at night, and we're not going to be treated to a return of Tom Snyder. Is that what you're trying to say? Well, I'll be with Tom Snyder later in the month, so let's be You don't fair. want to badmouth him. Absolutely not. Never did. But uh, I hope so. We don't know for sure. In other words, some of the people who are on the AIDS combination have been on it now for a year and a half. They were the first experimental cases. The guy was just man of the year, David Ho who's down at the Diamond Center in New York and was trained at Mass General, now wants some of his early AIDS cocktail patients to go off it and see if they're cured. Now, you understand that's like taking somebody who's on insulin. Oh, we're going to send you out in the desert without insulin for about a month and see what happens to your diabetes. Nobody wants to do it yet, and you can understand why, because being on it, regularly taking these drugs every eight hours, unfailingly, has led to this well-being for me and for... I think about 20,000 other people in America. It's very expensive, but it's the avenue, John, that w the developments will have to be made in. Before we're done talking, yeah. remind me if I forget, I want you to give out the address of the sure. David Brudnoy Research Foundation at Mass General we'll for people that would like to get involved in this a little more. But let's talk a little bit about the book. We were joking the other day about the questions, <laughs> the, pr the canned questions that yes. publicists send out with books. Right. Why did you write the book and so forth? Yes. I got to use one of those, though, because okay. I was wondering about it, and that is... Not, what, not the ones that I wrote for it, I hope. What, no, you, no. You didn't even get it. I That's threw a, those away. Oh, my God. What does the title, Life is Not a Rehearsal, mean? It means that I think someone who has spent, as I have, so many years kind of deferring gratification, except sexually, which is another story, and also saying, well, you know, I've got plenty of time for this. Uh, I'm going to live forever. I don't have to really see friends because I'll be around tomorrow. And so I suddenly realized when I emerged from that nine-day coma that I nearly died, and, and gradually, as you and other friends put to me the truth of this, I said, you know, I could easily not be here, and then what would I be saying if, I, if there's an afterlife about missed opportunities? I've decided not to be a hedonist, but rather to put into today all the deferments that I would ordinarily, in my healthier days, have said, later, later, later. Well, give me an example that's suitable for a family program. Uh, well, for one thing, instead of feeling I have to see every single bad movie, because if I don't, the, my, my, my listeners on, on radio, my readers in the community newspapers will feel cheated. I say, you know, so what if I don't see it? I'll go to dinner with some friends. I will try to relax a little bit, occasionally read a novel for fun, occasionally say, look, I don't have the energy to do this. I'll go to bed early. Even, and this has not happened yet, even take a night off from work if I feel ill. I haven't felt ill enough to do that, but I used to feel so guilty about it. I mean, you remember the month and a half or so before I was hospitalized when I tried to convince myself I had a little case of the flu. Coughing and hacking on Hor the air. Horrible flu, purple feet, I mean, just ghastly sort of things going on. I must say, even at that, you sounded better than Tom Snyder. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, he doesn't mean it. He doesn't mean it. Uh, uh, well, well, look, you... You get the point. In other words, I believe that, that we should take every moment that we have and maximize it. And, and while it's a cliché, I don't think the title's been used before with a book, as far as I know the phrase, rather, but it might have been. It's, it's a cliché. Life is not a rehearsal. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Nonetheless, it seems to me that people like me understand the reality of it. We, we cannot keep 
deferring and saying, I've got plenty of time. Who knows how much time? In the book, Life is Not a Rehearsal, you uh, at one point talk about your life as a journey of discovery and acceptance. Yes. And it struck me that those adjectives could also describe the reaction of the greater Boston community to your first your illness, yes. then the uh, discovery of uh, your homosexuality mm -hmm. and the nature of your illness. Right. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, first of all, what you felt, what you have since felt coming back from the community, and what you think people went through and why they reacted the way they did. I'm not sure about what they went through, but I can tell you what the reaction was on me. As you know, because you were there and you were a wise counselor when it was apparent that I was going to have to reveal the nature of the illness, that my apprehension wasn't that I'd be cast out of radio or television, I'd be chased down the street with people with pitchforks, but rather that I would be regarded somehow as less than I had been because I had a disease which was at that point assumed to be invariably fatal. And secondly, though the sexuality matter was not a, a big secret, I mean most people I think in the know knew it, and certainly a great many fans, it wasn't something that I walked around parading. I didn't feel any need to. And I thought all of a sudden, jolt, their conservative libertarian talk host is gay and has AIDS and da 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 da, what does this mean? And I assumed there'd be a kind of withdrawal, not recoiling. In fact, it was exactly the opposite. This is an amazing thing. It was a pouring out of friendliness, even if I might say affection, or if you can use the L word love from some people. An amazing amount of people saying, we care about you, you are ours, we care for you, whatever you are. And this, this it seemed to me, was one of the sustaining things that made me feel almost an obligation to get better. I felt, my God, if they feel this way, and it's not just an act. Some people may have written a letter or called me up in order to appear kindly, but most people don't send a letter anymore unless they mean it. I mean, strangers. I felt this is a token of something. Now, I don't know why it seems to have worked. My nature or whatever seems not to have been so difficult for people to take. But I, I tell you, John, it's almost as if I'm more involved in the community and more accepted than even before. Maybe I'm now, wrong. Now, the skeptics would say, and some did say, if I recall correctly, that a normally somewhat homophobic public yes. here in the greater Boston area, except, although you could argue that's a, 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 a misplaced stereotype given sure. our congressional delegation, but uh, the, the are, skeptics... Are you talking about Moakley again? The skeptics no. would say, <laughs> let's Sorry, leave John. him out of this. All right, you leave Tom Snyder, I'll leave Moakley. <laughs> okay. Deal. All right. The skeptics would say yeah. that this normally somewhat homophobic yeah. public accepted you yes. because they knew you so well and because mm -hmm. your politics matched, in many cases, theirs. Right. Any truth in that? I, I don't think it's skepticism. I think it's quite right. I think that, in fact, one of the reasons that people were able to uh, take these contrary feelings, not so much homophobia, which is an odd word in any case, but an apprehension that uh, sort of public homosexuals tend to be left-wing and tend to be, um, should we say, somewhat exuberant, to be polite about it. They took the fact that you've got my politics, which tend to be more like their politics, and perhaps in many ways overlap uh, almost 95%, with a sexuality and say, well, look, maybe this isn't an anomaly. Maybe there's not a disjuncture between it. But certainly, I think if I'd been a wild-eyed, radical, screaming leftist, uh, people who didn't like me for that could have added another reason for not liking me, though it would have bothered the Cambridge liberals because they're supposed to like you if you're gay. You know, the ideology, I think, that we kid about, whether it's left-wing or conservative, is stereotypical. But most people, it seems to me, around here at least, have been very open. I haven't become some sort of wet ra uh, wash rag which, you know, I just become sort of Mr. Nice Guy. Kind of a, I still get kind of a gay radio version of Tammy Faye Baker. God something. help us, yes, but no, not the mascara. <laughs> I, I still get an enormous <laughs> charge out of taking the little rapier and going, Nye! you know, I mean, it's fun. I mean, I'm not, I haven't turned soft, I think. But there's a civility level that is possible. We have among our colleagues some wonderful people in radio and television, but some people make their livelihoods out of being unkind. I really don't think that, it, that that's it. Near the end of the book, as you recall, I quote Henry James, that there are three things that are important in life. One is to be kind, two is to be kind, and three is to be kind. Maybe overstating it, we can do what we have to do and say what we must say, and at the same time, not try to destroy people's lives as opposed to opposing their policies. I, I think a lot of people would be treated as I was treated were they 
God forbid to have to have to have the particular things that led to what has subsequently gone on. Knowing what you now have learned about this community, mm -hmm. uh, looking back on it now, mm -hmm. do you think you were unnecessarily cautious in concealing your sexuality over the years on the radio? Well, it was less concealed than just not talked about. In other words, I, right. people didn't ask me direct, blunt questions all the time about me. Sometimes people were uh, occasionally a little pushy on it. But I think I was more interested in concealing my medical condition because I didn't want to have, remember, I, I was um, diagnosed in the age of Ryan White, and I came out as AIDS person in the age of Magic Johnson. The difference in an, a six-year period from one of real apprehension, real wondering, what's it about? Can you get it by being in the same room? If you shake hands, can you get it? To an understanding of the fact that it's not so easily got and the people as admirable in his way as, as um, a Magic Johnson or a, a, a in his way as, as Greg Luganis or that, that wonderful boy Ryan, Ryan White and so on. I, I think that I felt, as you know, you were never told by me until I told a lot of people. Not because I don't love you as a friend and a brother, but because I didn't want to inflict it on people. I didn't want to be defined even by people who care for me in that manner. I don't think if I had it to do over again, I would tell any more than the people I told, just enough to sort of have a little support group in case. What do you, uh, I mean, you're going to be going out around the country promoting the book now. Right. To, among other course, places, Tom Snyder's program. Oh, right, Tom right. Snyder. Yes, right. the Joe Moakley of talk radio. <laughs> um, what do you hope... <laughs> That, I mean, people yeah. around here who've listened to you right. for years have this rich body of knowledge and, yeah. and will probably get a lot of things out of this that people in Topeka, etc., will not. Yeah. What do you hope that those casual acquaintances you're about to make take away from reading this? Number one, in terms of simply practical advice to people, listen to your body, not your ideology when you get ill. Something I did not learn until I was nearly dead. And as the book points out, and as you know, there were a few minutes waiting between. I was rushed into the hospital and, and death. We've been told that by doctors. Secondly, I'd like to have people see that it is not so anomalous, after all, to have my politics and my sexuality. I don't think that, you know, the notion that you have to be left-wing to be gay would suggest that you have to be right-wing to be straight. Ponder that for a moment. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, conservatives and liberals who are heterosexual don't assume that the one follows from the other or is coterminous with it. I try simply to say, here's my politics, here's my sexuality, and finally, <coughs> excuse me, I'd like people to understand that you can have a very interesting life and at the same time make some horrendous mistakes in behavior. My, my drug and alcohol decade and a variety of other things. And you know for a fact, having been on the receiving end of a telephone call for me, that I nearly got killed one night by picking up the wrong person. So I'm a bright guy who hasn't always acted in a bright way. Um, and I hope that by buying multiple copies of this and giving this to relatives, people will also learn uh, the pleasure of giving, which is a nice thing. It was David Rudnoy's final request that those wanting to commemorate his life do so by considering a donation to the Massachusetts General Hospital Fund he established after his recovery there in 1994. If you want to honor David and help the fight against AIDS, send a check to the David Rudnoy Fund for AIDS Research, Massachusetts General Hospital, 100 Charles River Plaza, Suite 600, Boston, Massachusetts, 02114 dash. 4719. That address again, the David Rudnoy Fund for AIDS Research, Massachusetts General Hospital, 100 Charles River Plaza, Suite 600, Boston, Massachusetts, 02114-4719. We hope you've enjoyed these Brudnoy memories. To listen to his commentary over the years was a pleasure. To work alongside him was an honor. To be his friend, a rare privilege. I'm John Keller. Thanks for watching.